This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Welcome to the, um, the Archives and Society seminar, the last of the term, um, and we're delighted to welcome as our, as our speaker this evening, Richard Espley, who is a research librarian, British, Irish and post-colonial languages and literatures at the Senate's House Libraries at the University of London. Um, and he's speaking on what I know will be a fascinating subject. I asked him to come and speak on this, so I thought it was a fantastic subject and really looking forward to hearing it. Um, and Richard's paper title is Collection and Concealment, Archiving the Transgressive at Senate House Library, University of London. Richard. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for coming. I should, I, I realised in retrospect that I really should have put the words First World War in the title, um, particularly given that this would not be the first time I talked about uh, collecting pornography in Senate House Library in this building, so um, it may have been an ambiguous title, but I will be talking about um, suppressed material in the First World War. Um, the rather blurred little image on the right there is from um, a National Archives uh, home, well, a file currently in the National Archives from Home Office Records. And this is the code which was used to uh, judge um, all leaflets published on war issues. They could either be hostile leaflets, which made them suspicious, they could be dealt with and ignored, or they could be destroyed. Um, I started to think about this material because of the redoubtable woman on the extreme left here, uh, who's Caroline Plain, a very ardent and committed pacifist and internationalist who wrote four books about the futility and the preventability of the First World War and who gave to the library where I work um, a collection of books specifically designed to convince future generations of students of the folly of war. Along the way, she collected boxes and boxes of wartime ephemera, press cuttings, leaflets, posters, fashion catalogues, all kinds of things. Um, and there are in her collection occasional examples like this. Um, reasonably professionally produced bits of paper attacking government policy, attacking the whole idea of the war. Um, the one on the right there um, was published by the English Neutrality League. It's possibly one of the shortest lived peace organisations in the world. It was founded four days before the declaration of war and was abandoned two days after the declaration of war. But along the way, it managed to produce vast quantities of this poster calling on Englishmen to do their duty. Um, the spidery handwriting in the top is Caroline Plains. Um, things like that are very rare, not least because they were suppressed quite intentionally. They were rounded up and destroyed. Um, they're also very fragile. They tend to be printed on very cheap paper. It's very difficult, I think, for us to imagine the power of the pamphlet um, because it is basically the preserve of the double glazing salesman and the pizza takeaway now. Um, but the pamphlet was the chosen weapon of revolutionary thinkers and those who dissented from any kind of national discourse. Um, this is a cartoon from Punch, which it's rather lazy to turn to Punch. It's a very easy way to get a, a picture of a national prejudice. But um, this gentleman from Whitehall uh, firing at the evil pacifist crow um, the feathers that are falling away from them there, if you can't see, they, they, it's spelt out pamphlets. Um, and I think there is a suggestion there that they're falling on bare earth, that they're going to take root, um, that they're going to cause us trouble. Um, I was talking to my colleague, the archivist in the library, about um, how lucky we were even to have a few of these pamphlets in the plain collection. And he said, oh, well, you know, we've got a, a second collection of wartime pamphlets. Um, and it has the glamorous name of MS-1152. Um, I'd never heard of it. Um, when I found it, it, or when it was found for me and delivered to the reading room, it consists of 260 items. Um, it's a fairly concerted effort to amass all kinds of material critical of the national war effort. Um, some of it is outright pacifist, some of it is merely anti-conscription, um, a lot of it is from various socialist groups arguing about the solidarity of international labour and how war was a betrayal of that. 
Um, and most intriguingly, about a hundred of them have annotations in either pencil or pen, but all in the same hand. And this is by far the most common annotation suppressed. Um, I've given you three examples just to show they genuinely are all in the same handwriting, um, and also it is reasonably common. Um, basically what MS1152 contains is someone's attempt to capture all of those pamphlets you can see raining down from the evil crow. Many of them were illegal. Um, in some instances, like this, I know you can't read these, but it's just to give you a sense of the scale of his annotation. Um, in some cases, these are very lengthy descriptions of court proceedings brought against the authors, the publishers, the distributors of these items. Um, it's actually a matter of interest how this information was gathered because these cases weren't reported in the press. Um, there's also no real suggestion that the collector of these pamphlets is impartial. Um, he is extremely critical of the way that the Defence of the Realm Act, um, the piece of legislation which justified the censorship, um, is being implemented. Um, you can probably read these, but even if you can't, you can see the exclamation mark, which is a, a sure sign of someone pushed beyond exasperation um, at the obviousness of his own argument. Um, and he is extremely indignant at the way in the, in the uh, supposed cause of liberty um, people are being um, silenced. I am very reluctant to, to enter into a, a history of how censorship operated in the First World War, but I think I will have to have a go at it briefly. Um, so in cases like those where we saw the very long annotations, people could be prosecuted in a court under the Defence of the Realm Act for um, anything that was uh, likely to prejudice the king's ability to prosecute the war. Um, that actually happened reasonably rarely. What happened far more often was that under Regulation 27 of the Defence of the Realm Act, printers were invited to submit any leaflet or pamphlet on a war-related issue to the official press bureau. Um, the official press bureau could then intervene at any point to stop publication. Silence from the official press bureau could not be interpreted as approval. Um, it didn't mean anything. Um, you can still be raided. Um, what tended to happen was that lots of this material was added to blacklists um, in the Home Office that were referred to as Z-lists. Um, if your pamphlet was on a Z-list, that meant that the police could raid your premises or your house or your church if they thought the pamphlets were there and seize them and then check with the Home Office whether they should destroy them. Um, there's another regulation, Regulation 51, that basically gave the police carte blanche to do that any time they were a bit suspicious. Um, and they didn't only seize pamphlets, they seized printing presses, they melted down type, um, they, they basically closed down an operation. And just to make things slightly more complicated, the Postmaster General kept his own separate list of material that could be seized and destroyed if anyone put it in the post. Um, I stress all of that because there was an awful lot of people looking for this material. There was an awful lot of people who had every legal right to seize it and destroy it. And also, it was very common for a publisher to be unaware that their publications were on these lists until the police appeared. And it might be two months after they published something, and then the police would suddenly appear to seize everything else. Um, there are records of the Press Bureau and um, its allied body, the Advisory Committee on Leaflets, um, at the National Archives. And just to give an idea of the scope of MS1152, about 40% of all of the pamphlets unambiguously recorded as banned and scheduled to be destroyed in those records are present in our collection. Um, it's quite a big proportion when you consider how many policemen were out there trying to hunt down every single copy. Um, and if, for example, the police raided a print shop and they found a list of people to whom that shop had supplied copies, they would then go and try and find every single copy. And there are lists in the National Archives, where policemen are ticking off individual copies they've managed to destroy. Um, a lot of those banned leaflets also bizarrely are um, anti-vaccination campaigns, um, because this undermined enlistment, because the first thing that happened to you when you enlisted was you were vaccinated. 
Um, and whoever collected this material had no interest whatsoever in vaccination, so he didn't collect that. Um, but however you look at it, that, that is still quite a big proportion. Um, it also has to be said that little things like this, which is about three inches high, um, they wouldn't have bothered to record that. There are notes in the file saying assorted postcards and broad, um, broadsheets destroyed, handbills. Um, this, bizarrely, um, as a sideline, uh, was actually written by Herbert Morrison, um, who, of course, later went on to serve in the War Cabinet in the Second World War. Um, but he printed this in the Labour Leader and signed it, and then it was published anonymously. I love the line, when the military were used against you in the strike, did you wonder if your king was quite in love with you? Um, but um, the collector of these pamphlets is written suppressed on that, and I absolutely believe him, even though there's no evidence. Um, I could talk about just the pamphlets all evening, but I will try not to. Um, I'll just show you, this is a, a, an example of an, a now incredibly scarce magazine called Satire. There were 13 issues published. Every single one of them was banned, seized and destroyed. Um, the editor, um, who was deaf and dumb, um, that's always recorded in the court proceedings, um, was eventually fined £25 for attempting to operate an illegal lottery um, and it, it killed his business. But um, how the collector of these items managed to get copies of things like this that were being pretty effectively hunted is, is a fair question in itself. So there's a, there's a significant collection of pamphlets and ephemera, very critical of the war, um, which it would have been dangerous to even own. Um, this poster um, Sir Archibald Bodkin, um, later scourge of the literary press, um, misspoke during a trial of a pacifist and uttered the words, war will become a impossible if all men were to have the view that war is wrong. Um, he, he meant that in, as an argument on his own side, um, but it obviously backfired. Um, the No Conscription Fellowship printed it as a poster, um, and possession of this became illegal, and there's a pacifist called Edward Fuller whose house was searched and the police found one copy of this poster folded in his bureau, not on display, there was no suggestion he was distributing it, and he was imprisoned for six weeks um, for simply owning it. And I think we can assume that whoever collected them wasn't just an interested bystander. Um, this little, um, quite not, not too ambitious um, card to enter a UDC public meeting and the Union of Democratic Control, for democratic control, of democratic control, was arguably one of the biggest and the most influential anti-war organisations, and their primary aim was to bring um, any decision about the declaration of war back under parliamentary control, obviously something we still haven't achieved. Um, on the back of this, there's a note saying that the meeting was broken up by Canadian soldiers and other rowdies. Um, I think that suggests that whoever wrote that was there. Um, similarly, there's this envelope saying that the material inside was picked up in an anti-conscription meeting that was broken up by hired ruffians. Um, they were literally picked up. I apologise for these very bad images, but um, you can see, I hope, that there is still mud um, on these pamphlets. Um, this, this kind of staining here is actually mud from Finsbury Park. Um, you can see it more clearly on the back, and you can also see my collar, frankly. <laughs> um, but again, I think this suggests that someone was there picking this material up. Um, yeah. um, there are also other annotations that suggest this person was very closely involved. This is the name and address of the branch secretary of the No Conscription Fellowship. Again, the No Conscription Fellowship was incredibly enthusiastically hunted down, um, and it would have been not advisable to record um, in a public institution the name and address of one of their officers. Um, so when I was thinking about asking to speak in this series, what I was thinking was, it is striking that there's a publicly funded institution which is simultaneously reflecting society and also recording fairly vigorous dissent against society in a potentially illegal way. Um, but of course the pressing issue 
at least for me, is who is doing this, who collected all of this material, who's scribbling on them, who is so outraged. Very early on, and, and with almost no evidence, I decided that it was the librarian of the University of London, um, Reginald Arthur Rye. Um, Rye was appointed to be librarian in 1906, and he was forced into retirement by ill health in 1944 at the age of 69. Um, so this could possibly have been Rye who was collecting this material. He was 29 in 1914, well within the age where he could have enlisted. He was unmarried. Uh, he would have been subject to conscription in 1916, but he spent the whole of the war in his office. Um, so was he a dissenter who was smuggling this material in? There are some hints that whoever collected it was a university official. This envelope, which I've already shown you, is a University of London envelope. Um, and it has the same handwriting on it. Um, and the way that many of the pamphlets have notes about being rare, or very rare, that's the obsession of a librarian. It's not the concern of, of a political activist. Um, so I started trying to find out anything about Rye, um, and all I found when I did find anything at all was tepid praise and kind of padded out accounts of what he'd achieved after he died in 1945. Um, the most human, the most memorable account of him is in an obituary in the library record, which said, Mr. Rye was a man of a scholarly and retiring nature and had a deep sense of humour, which he rarely showed. <laughs> that was written by a woman who had worked with Rye for 14 years and had worked in the same office as his deputy for 12 years. Um, so either he was the most boring man on earth, or he was camouflaging himself and hiding himself. Um, Rye got married in 1915 at the age of 30. There's nothing, I was 36 when I got married, so there's nothing unusual in that. But um, when you look at a poster like this that was published in 1915, um, this was a scheme advanced by Lord Derby, known as the group system, um, but the headline there is single men first. Um, these kind of systems were designed to avoid conscription. Everyone knew conscription would be unpopular, so by offering this kind of fair system of calling up younger men first, it was felt that it might not be necessary. But when Rye got married in 1915, he would have moved himself from the 13th group to the 36th group. Um, Rye never enlisted, he never attested his willingness to enlist, so he wouldn't have been able to claim protection. Um, but there is a fairly clear message here that it's single men who are going first, and it's an odd coincidence, if nothing else, that Rye got married. They remained married for 30 years, um, and there is no evidence that they had either a happy marriage or an unhappy marriage. Um, a bit more convincingly, these are two samples of handwriting. Um, the handwriting on the left is Reginald Rise, unambiguously from an official letter in the library. Uh, the handwriting on the right is from a pamphlet. Um, they are very similar. I could bore you to tears with dozens of images of the same word, but um, they, they are very similar. They're not identical. Um, but then the letters are all written in, in quite an informal style. Um, so it, it, it's difficult to say, but it's fairly convincing. In 1916, um, in the library minutes, there is suddenly this statement that they've realised that conscription will catch married men, and an application should be made to the proper authorities for exemption of Mr Rye on the ground of indispensability. Um, this was within the Military Service Act. It, it was within every employer's right to say that somebody was indispensable. Um, the fact that it was a university making that request would have made it far more likely that it would have been acceded to. Um, but the recommendation was acted upon um, and Rye was exempted from service. Now, at that point, I was pretty convinced that Rye was a pacifist, that he was attending UDC meetings and NCF meetings and that he'd secretly smuggled this material into the library. Um, and then I found Rye's staff record. Um, it's a fairly informal staff record. Uh, 
and it's not the best image, but just here on the left, somebody has written in nicely distancing inverted commas the word CO next to Rye's name. Um, red ink in this ledger signifies this is an entry about the First World War. Um, CO obviously seems to tell us that Rye is a conscientious objector. That, that's misleading in one very important way in that Rye never objected on the grounds of his conscience because he never had to. He never had to stand in front of a tribunal and say that he couldn't fight because the university took care of it and made him indispensable. I have no idea who wrote that. We can't assume that it was necessarily an official mark or that Rye was happy to have that written next to him. It could have been an attempt to discredit him. Um, and certainly I would say that the Vice-Chancellor who had to make the request that Rye be recognised as indispensable is unlikely to have had much sympathy with a conscientious objector in that this is the Vice-Chancellor. Uh, this is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alfred, Alfred Pierce Gould of the Territorial Regiment, Surgeon General of the largest territorial hospital in England, um, and also an extremely active recruiter and organiser of the University of London Officer Training Corps. Um, perhaps Sir Alfred was misled. Um, perhaps Rye was a pacifist and he managed to conceal that issue of his conscience beneath a layer of his indispensability. But supposing that it was Rye, sparing of his intimacy, who assembled these items, um, what did he actually do with them? Well, the collection was not recorded or given a reference number until 2007, 89 years after the armistice. Uh, it was not added to any existing guide or list or catalogue of the contents of this library. Um, and any request at any point before 2007 um, as to whether we had this material would almost certainly have been met with a perfectly honest answer that, to the best of our knowledge, we didn't. Um, physically, where these boxes of material were between 1918 and 2007 is unclear. Um, in that year, they were found in a secure, closed storage area um, with other special collections material, which was catalogued. Um, and they were found close to books that had been in the office of one of Rye's successors. So it, it's perfectly conceivable they stayed in Rye's office for 20 or 30 years and then were moved to storage. I do want to stress that this is unusual. We're not a library that, that, that is riddled with pockets of material of which we're totally unaware. Um, I, in fact, I think it's so unusual that it, it's frankly suspicious. It's odd. Um, they were found in archival boxes, but they had no markings on them of any kind. Um, the material didn't have library stamps on it, which is the very first thing that happens to everything that comes into this building. Um, they weren't being treated as part of the library collection, but they would have made a perfectly good candidate for being absorbed into the library. They're printed material. We have hundreds of wartime pamphlets in the collection already. Um, there is, we, you have to address the issue of whether the library didn't deal with them because they were too busy and they were short staffed, especially given um, the fact that many of the staff were at war. Um, but a librarian in extremis can be pretty ruthlessly pragmatic. Um, this is a, a, a card from our card catalogue, the only catalogue of the library in 1918. Um, and it's probably the worst, laziest piece of cataloguing I've ever seen in my life. Um, any reader browsing the card catalogue for the word war would have found this card telling them that we owned 52 mainly English recruiting posters from the First World War. Um, but my point is we could easily have done that for the pamphlets. It would have taken a minute. Um, these cards were being generated at a phenomenal rate. Um, it really isn't a matter of time. We could have dealt with them in some way. I don't think they just weren't being made a priority and I don't think they were being added to a backlog. I don't even really think they were being hidden. Um, the, the usual paradox with any kind of transgressive material is that um, you're collecting it and you're concealing it. You process it like everything else and then at the last minute you conceal it. Um, that's what tends to happen with, with pornography or with um, dangerous material that might help someone build a bomb. Um, but that never happened here. They were being treated in a very different way. 
they weren't entered into the accession registers, there's nothing about them in the donation files. Um, I think we took, as a library and under RISE management, we took a, a decision to regard them as not being part of the library. Um, a library is synonymous with the idea of conscious selection. We Everything that is on our shelves is there because someone like me decided to put it there. Um, and I can see arguments for moving pacifist, potentially still illegal material outside that structure. But we didn't put any subject headings on them, we didn't put a class mark on them, we didn't list them in a subject index. They basically are receiving no help from any member of library staff in communicating to our users what they are or where they are. Um, and it feels to me as if they're being treated oddly, as if they're self-sufficient, as if they can fend for themselves, um, that somehow it's important just to have them sitting there. Um, and I think the category of material that they're being pushed into has something to do with archives, but I'm thinking of the word archive with a capital A. Um, but behind all of the paper bundles and the red tape in, an, in the National Archives or in lots of other repositories, there is a seductive and a powerful idea of what the archive is and what it should be. Um, We've all heard archives referred to as memory organisations or the memory of society. Um, and there's a sense where, as, as Antoinette Burton says, the archive is the ultimate arbiter of truth and a place that has acquired a kind of sacral character in modern society. Um, and I think it, it, it's that sacral, comprehensive character that helps us understand what Rye was doing. I initially thought Rye was dreaming of adding these collections to the library in, in a future society where people were more forgiving. Um, and Lord knows when he was forced to retire in 1944, this was not the city to start talking about pacifist pamphlets. And this building was occupied by the Ministry of Information who were charged with suppressing um, seditious pamphlets. So th it wouldn't have been good timing. But that doesn't really make any sense. He could have removed these boxes when he left. We know that he removed a great deal of material when he left. Um, all of it his own, I'm sure. Um, he could have given them to another library or a society that would have looked after them at any point before 1939. Um, he could have had them catalogued at any point in the 21 years between the end of the First World War and the beginning of the Second. But what he actually did was to leave them unmarked as though they were some secret weapon that was going to deploy themselves at, at, at a later point. Um, and there is an, a, a, a subjective sense that he felt it would be unwise to intervene, not only unnecessary, but unwise and unnecessary. Um, those who are identified as, as minorities, who are oppressed or criminalised or dehumanised by the state, frequently have amassed archives as a concrete expression of something that is more important than the state, more important than the repression. And we can see that in situations which are infinitely more horrific than Rye's situation. But in apartheid South Africa, in the segregated South of the United States, um, and it, it's not a comparison I make lightly, and I don't claim any kind of equivalence, but um, in the efforts of Emmanuel Ringelblum and his colleagues in, in the unspeakable horror of the Warsaw Ghetto, who took time to bury an archive of their suffering, uh, with a card on top bearing the words, May History Be Our Witness. All of those actions, and, and in a far less horrific situation, rise, don't just consist of leaving evidence to the future. Um, the archive itself becomes a proxy for the collector and for their suffering, and indeed I think for history itself. It's being made to stand in as the basis for grasping the origin of what's happened. Um, and there is a dangerous collapsing of history itself and the archive, uh, which has got nothing to do with retention schedules and paper bundles. Um, the archive in that sense is, is apolitical and it's neutral because it's totally comprehensive and it absorbs everything. Um, it exceeds all, all of the repositories and all of the networks of repo repositories and becomes the material evidence of all of humanity. 
And I think in that presentation, all that's needed is the corrective reintroduction of that little bit of material that has been suppressed. Uh, and the archive will some, somehow reassemble and reassert itself. Rye, I think, left this archive as his witness, but also as its own witness. And I am going to do something terrible and briefly mention Jacques Derrida, but very briefly. Um, Derrida speaks very famously of archive fever, or, or rather of being on mal d'archive. And for Derrida, archive fever is to never rest interminably from searching for the archive, to run after the archive, even when there's too much of it, even when there's none of it, to have a compulsive, repetitive, and nostalgic desire for the archive. That's definitely the experience of the researcher, but I think it's critically also the febrile activity of the person creating an archive, the drive that makes someone driven all beyond all human capacity to cope, to assemble an archive and to leave it to the future. Um, and I think that's the drive that is motivating Reginald Rye. These pamphlets were never meant for this library. They weren't meant for any library. They were meant for posterity, and they were meant to restore the impossible but for Rye essential idea of the archive. Of course, not only does that archive not exist, but lots of other archives do. Um, and we've all read our Foucault and our Derrida, and we know that archives are exercises in power. As Caroline Steedman says in a reading of Derrida, the creation of the archive is at one and the same time the establishment of state power. And in the words of South African archivist Van Harris, archives at once express and are instruments of prevailing relations and power. So is there a lingering sense still in which Rye's desire to document all this, to archive it, was actually correct and it was necessary. It, is his shadow archive a corollary to what's going on in Q, built on state power? Places like Q, Foucault tells us, make it possible to record and preserve those discourses that one wishes to remember. In a culture commemorating the war, where the views of Michael Gove can be taken seriously even for a heartbeat, um, did someone and does someone need to preserve this material? The National Archives, quite rightly, is, is digitising war diaries and service records. It's digitising the records of the tribunals which process conscientious objectors. Was there a need to have this stash of material to counterbalance that? Well, while I've been researching the exhibition that we're putting on next year upstairs about dissent, I've met lots of peace campaigners, present day peace campaigners, and they've all very wearily told me that if I go to the National Archives, everything will be done to prevent me from seeing material about anti-war movements in the First World War. I'm told that the file descriptions are unreliable, um, but mostly the supreme, unconquerable myth of the archive that the good stuff is there somewhere, but they won't tell me where. Um, <laughs> I think that arises from the fact that we all know what an archive is. It's the place where the origin of everything is recorded. Um, it is impartial and it is complete. And there's a terrible elision between a, a public building in Kew full of civil servants and, and this impossible dream. Um, material can possibly get concealed through state suppression, but it must exist. It has to exist. Um, I organised a, a conference here last month about censorship and, and we had a paper from a lady whose father had been watched by MI5 for 50 years. And it was a very interesting paper, but she, she spoke with despair of archivists in queue refusing to reveal to her where the redacted pages were, where the missing files were. Um, because they had to be there, because she needed them, and I, I completely respect her need for them but that translated into the fact that they must be there, when of course they're not. Um, just as Rye knew that the archive just needed that little bit of careful restoration, she was appealing to Q to appeal to the security services to restore the archive. And we're all enthralled to that idea of the archive, um, myself included. Um, but of course the irony is that almost, well, a fair proportion of these documents that Rye collected are in the National Archives, that I found it very easy to find them. Um, 
There are annotated office copies of most of these banned pamphlets in HO139, the official record series of the official press bureau. And there are also dozens of pamphlets in, in there that Rai didn't get and that I'd never seen before and as far as I can tell are not in the British Library. So actually the biggest concentration of anti-war material in this country is almost certainly in the National Archives where I was being told there was nothing or it would be concealed. Now of course those files are overwhelmed by a, a sense of disapprobation from the civil servants who assembled them and of course they're not complete but then there's no archive in the world that is complete. But the idea that there is a grievance, that the archive is incomplete, that this is a major problem, is a fundamental discourse in society, and I'd suggest even archivists are in its thrall. Um, this is the discovery record from the National Archives for HO139. Um, these are the surviving records of the official press bureau, the majority of these records were destroyed by virtue of the Home Office second schedule of the 3rd of February 1928, and most of the files now preserved have lost much of their original content. And I'm not criticising, believe me, any cataloguer at TNA, I'm absolutely not. This is a demonstration of the impossible weight that is put on the idea of an archive. Um, the first thing I suppose one could say about that at a mundane level is it stops people going to the inquiry desk and saying where are the rest of the files and that, that Lord knows that that's a, a laudable aim. Um, but th there is I think something else going on there. It, it's very clearly placing responsibility on the Home Office in the past but while it does that it seems to recognise that that was a flawed decision. It, it even, I, I can't resist saying, there's, there's a submerged hint of an angry cataloguer <laughs> in, in the word virtue, destroyed by virtue of the hammer. It's such a gloriously unstable word. Um, but um, in the choice of the word lost, again, there's, there's a similar recognition. Unnecessary things aren't lost, they're deselected. Lost implies something of value has gone away, and it also implies carelessness. Um, of course, what's actually being said there is true of every record series in the National Archives and every record series in every archive anywhere. Most of, them is mis most of it is missing. Um, and it's not missing, it's been deselected. It's been me removed on purpose. And if that wasn't true, the National Archives' holdings of official records would long ago have filled more salt mines than our national desire for seasoning could create. Um, but it's being emphasised here in a record about state suppression. Um, there's an awkward sense of lamenting the incompleteness. Um, Van Harris, in, in the light of his experience of South Africa, says that archivists are crippled by a fear of exercising improper control. They understand the language they use, the very words they use and that are available to them in the catalogue are instruments of power. They feel compelled to disclose their complicity. And I, th I think that word complicity is striking. There's a sense here that a crime has been committed against the archive, the complete, idealised, impossible archive. Um, and it's that same ineradicable dream that I think Rye was trying to leave behind, something that would plug the gap. So to finish, I, I've sat here and, and adopted the position of the wise external observer uh, looking with a discerning eye at people's foolish searches for unambiguous truth. Um, and I've talked about Rye's hope for an ultimate justifying record and the pressures on an archivist that make them apologise for things that are beyond their control. And I've spoken airily of Derrida's archival fever. But to return to Reginald Rye, I'd hope that by now I've more or less convinced some of you that the quietly defiant secret pacifist Reginald Rye was the collector and annotator of these pamphlets that he secreted them in the library. And there's every chance that that's true. It could well be. But to do that, I spent days in the University of London archives, days more in the National Archives in Kew, with a burning desire to discover the truth about Reginald Rye from files that were assembled for a completely different purpose and have no interest in the life of a middle-aged librarian, either Rye or myself. And I too thought if I sat in the reading room at Kew for long enough and I sifted paper from record series of ever more tangential 
series that had nothing to do with my initial inquiry, I would find something. I'd find a note about the dangerous activities of Reginald Rye, the sham nature of his marriage, or suspicions about the patriotism of his Irish father-in-law. And when asked how my day had gone, I even in retrospect hear myself saying that I hadn't found a smoking gun, which is a phrase I detest, <laughs> even if it were applicable, and it isn't. Um, we're all trained cynics, but I hope I carried some of you along with me in suggesting that this was Rye. But Derrida's description of never rest interminably from searching for the archive, that's pretty much me for the last three months. I don't know whether Rye was connected to these documents, and neither do you. I, I strongly suspect that he was, but I'll never be able to prove it. And it shouldn't, of course, matter. What matters is the extraordinary content and the poignancy of the passion and the determination behind these pamphlets in the face of prosecutions and fines and imprisonment and hard labour. But I stopped seeing those records for what they were, and looking at those pamphlets, I started to think that hidden in all of it, somewhere waiting for me so that I could tell you, uh, was a glittering moment of revelation. Um, as Caroline Steedman warns all of us as archival searchers, the object, the event, the happening, the story from the past, has been altered by the very search for it, by its time and duration. What has actually been lost can never be found. That is not to say that nothing is found, but that thing is always something else. It's a creation of the search itself and the time the search took. Now, that's a book I know well. I have great respect for it and genuine affection. But when I was sitting in the archive fumbling about with red tape, all of that went out the window and I knew that I was about to find the truth. Archive fevers, therefore, can take many forms, and in exploring one, that of Reginald Rye, I have certainly found myself subject to another, and I've detected symptoms in many other people too. But to find a way out of that, to ease the pressure at inquiry desks and to stop librarians hiding things, um, but more importantly to understand how this culture does and should record itself, and to achieve a clearer view of state power and the role of dissent, we all need to reconsider the ludicrously optimistic expectations and the unjustified suspicious mistrust which we heap on the archive, and ultimately, perhaps, to re-examine the connection between society and archives. Thank you.